Historian Neil Ferguson, Professor Kotkin is always right. That's rule number one. Rule number two, see rule number one. Professor Kotkin on Uncommon Knowledge now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. A fellow here at the Hoover Institution, Stephen Kotkin is the author of nine big works of history, including the first two volumes of his biography of Joseph Stalin, Paradoxes of Power, 1878 to 1928, and Waiting for Hitler, 1929 to 1941. Professor Kotkin is now completing, you are, aren't you? Is now completing the third and final volume, Stalin, Totalitarian Superpower. And because he has so much time on his hands, he's amusing himself by writing a history of Siberia on the side. A believer in the application of history to contemporary policymaking, Stephen Cott consults widely and finds himself inundated with requests for interviews, but he accepts <clears throat> very few. <laughs> Stephen, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Five questions for Stephen Kotkin. Here's the first one. The coup attempt. June 24, under the command of Yevgeny Prigozhin, the Wagner Group, a private Russian mil militia, occupies Russian military headquarters in Rostock. In Rostov. It, Rostov, thank you. Prigozhin uploads a video calling the Russian oligarchy crooked and corrupt and the war in Ukraine unnecessary. Then he sends an armored column north toward Moscow. The, the column shoots down several Russian aircraft as it advances. President Putin appears on television to denounce the men he calls traitors. Once the force gets about two-thirds of the way to Moscow, they turn around. Prigozhin disappears, reportedly leaving Russia for Bielorussia. Putin reassures the country that order has been restored. <clears throat> Stephen Kotkin, in Foreign Affairs, interviewed on June 24th, as the coup attempt was taking place, quote, after all the storm went wrong, we could be right back where we started, close quote. Stephen, what happened? And are we right back where we started? So Prigozhin had a catering business. It was pretty successful because he got Kremlin contracts and then military contracts. And like many government contracts, they were no bid contracts, meaning he didn't have to be better than the other caterers. So you have a business that's making money and you need some protection. So he establishes a little bit of protection for himself and his businesses. That turns out to be an even bigger business. That's a mercenary army. And turns out that there's minerals in Africa. Who knew? And so he gets into that business as well. And so pretty soon he's a multi-billion dollar business. And in the beginning of June, the uh, defense minister announces that these businesses will now report to the defense ministry. So let's imagine that, I don't know, you build Microsoft or you build Apple or you build whatever. It's built a little differently here than over in Russia, but imagine. And all of a sudden, the Secretary of Defense announces, well, it's a great business. I own that business now, and we don't need you anymore. So he decides he's not going to give up his businesses. He's going to march on uh, first the military headquarters for the war in Ukraine, which is in the south of Russia. And then he's going to march on Moscow. And he's got armed fighters with heavy weapons. And Moscow is defended by riot police. Riot police are fine if you're just beating up demonstrators with no weapons. They can get that job done. But against people with heavy weapons who are battle-hardened, it's a different proposition. So Prigozhin starts marching, not himself. He stays in the headquarters in a bunker, and he sends his men, about 8,000. And they're closing in on the capital. Putin went nose to nose with a pretender, and Putin blinked. 
Kind of. <laughs> so um, Prigozhin is not going to give up his businesses just like that. He didn't gain them. Hold on. Without You're working hard. This was purely about money. No, it's never purely about money in Russia. No. Money and power is the same variable in Russia. But so you get money by being in power. Hank Paulson was at Goldman, made his 500 million, and then he became Treasury Secretary. It's not the way you do it in Russia. First, you become Treasury Secretary, and then you make your 500 million. So you need to have connections to power. And by the way, uh, he pays off everybody. So the people who are supposed to stop him from taking Moscow, they're on his payroll. It's the, this is Russia. And so what we see is uh, people don't rally around Putin and his regime while this group is marching. The military doesn't come out and make statements. They don't send troops. Um, there's no rallying of the political forces around Putin with statements. Everyone's playing a waiting game. Maybe this guy could be successful, maybe not. So you have three pieces to the regime that are important to know. First, you got the aura, the mystique, right? The, the fact that you are the power, therefore you know more, you're watching everything, you're infallible in your decision making. So that mystique, that aura, he lost already way before these events. He lost it in Ukraine because the war has been such a catastrophe for Russia. So he destroyed his own aura and mystique. So that didn't change. That had already happened. And the credit for that goes to the Ukrainians and their resistance, their courage, their ingenuity. They did that. The other piece, though, is the levers of power. Right? So you lose your aura, but you're still sitting in the Kremlin. So you've got control over the television stations, the security police, the tax police. There's nothing you don't have control over. The, the gas industry, the, the central bank. There's no reason for Putin to steal money and put it abroad because all the money is his if he wants it. So that's what the Kremlin is. So no mystique, no aura, that's gone. Right. But the levers of power. But then here's the third piece. The third piece is, what's the alternative, if any, to this guy? Is this guy forever? Or could we imagine somebody else? And maybe that somebody else could be better. Maybe that somebody else could get us out of the situation that this guy's got us in. So the other people are watching. Is Prigozhin that somebody else? especially because they're on his payroll. Not because they're doing that much for him, but just because he's got to keep all his flanks covered. So the so-called FSB, the security service that's the successor to the KGB, I'm guessing, I mean, they haven't shown me the paperwork for some reason, but I'm guessing those guys are on the payroll here. If you have a multi-billion dollar business, and those are, that's the security apparatus, they're going to want to cut. And so... Uh, the, the idea about maybe somebody could be better, that's his conundrum. You see, because if he empowers somebody else to crack down and to destroy Prigozhin, if he empowers somebody to put the lid back on, all of a sudden people think, oh, you know, that person looks pretty good. That person can not only put the lid back on against this crazy coup, but could in fact replace the Tsar and the Kremlin. So the dilemma for him is the same way he got into the pickle in the first place. You appoint loyalists who are incompetent because they're not smart enough to take you down. But then you have incompetent people running your stuff. But if you appoint somebody who's decisive, well, that person's decisive. And, it, and that third piece, aha, this guy might be better. And so, so that's the big upshot from this Stephen, event. you are describing exactly the dynamics of the mob 
this is the way they talk to each other on all those tapes that the FBI pulled together on the Mulberry Street with John Gotti. Yeah, well, so, so I'm from New York and I worked in New Jersey. I mean, <laughs> so, <laughs> it's but, not like it's a foreign okay, so, topic. So let me, and I watched The Godfather so, so, way so, back when and serious, I even read the book. <laughs> serious, question. Let me, let me, uh, serious question about Russia. George Kennan. George Kennan in 1947 in his famous article on foreign affairs Kennan argued that the Soviets had to treat the outside world as hostile because doing so provided the only justification, now I'm going to quote Kennan, quote, for the dictatorship without which they did not know how to rule, for cruelties they did not dare not to inflict, for sacrifices they felt bound to demand, close quote. The dictatorship they did not know, how, without which they did not know how to rule. Ivan the Terrible, Peter the Great, your boy Joseph Stalin, Vladimir Putin. This has been going on for centuries. Imperial Japan gives way to a liberal democracy. Nazi Germany gives way to a stable liberal democracy. Russia is the Russia of a thousand years. Why? What is it about, a serious question, what is it about Russia? So here's that other piece, that third piece, the alternative piece. Because for us, the alternative to uh, authoritarian regime is what happened in Japan or what happened in West Germany. It is the possibility of democracy or rule of law or constitutional order, however you want to describe it. But in the Russian case, the alternative to the power in the Kremlin is chaos, collapse, apocalypse. And so Putin is a calamity. He's a disaster. But the alternative to him is potentially in the minds of the, the people around him, dissolution, loss of the Russian state. And so as bad as he is, right, and he is calamitous across the board, the alternative in their mind could be much worse. And so they're kind of stuck in this inability to get to an alternative that's viable that doesn't equal collapse or chaos. So think, there are six possible futures to Russia, and there have been for a really long time. Maybe at least this is my view. Mm -hmm. The first one is France. You have absolutist monarchy, big bureaucracy. You have a revolutionary tradition, really messy, bloody and messy. You're threatening your neighbors, right, Napoleon. You blink your eye, it takes a while, and then you've overcome your absolutist tradition. You still have a big bureaucracy because you're descended from an absolutist tradition, but you're not an absolutist monarch anymore. Your revolutionary tradition has settled down, and you're not threatening your neighbors anymore. And so France. Now, we can argue that there are imperfections in France, and some of us may not see France as a model. We're just talking about Russia and France, and so what we've got in Russia, if it got to France, that would be a major achievement. So that's been the story for a long time. Can they get to France? Now, you can look at where they are now, and you can see where France is now, and you can see that the distance to travel there is not that slight. But anyway, that's the good outcome. That solves not only the war in Ukraine, but it solves the Russia problem as well. Because they can be who they are, just like the French, but they don't threaten their neighbors anymore. Right. Okay, so France. The second option is authoritarian leader, but don't threaten your neighbors. In other words, solve the Ukraine problem, but not the Russia problem. Mm -hmm. You're still stuck with some type of authoritarianism, which is difficult to overcome, but you recognize that trying to take over your neighbors is a losing game for Russia, not just for the neighbors. So authoritarianism, that's no longer a threat to the neighbors. The distance to that is much shorter. Right. And that's actually the potential solution to the Ukraine situation over a longer period of time. That would be winning the peace, not just the war. 
All right. Your third one, uh, which is relatively new, is Chinese puppet regime. This sounds absurd. How could we get a Chinese puppet regime in Russia? Right? Stalin was the big brother, Mao was the little brother, etc. But the Chinese interest in Russia, as we've seen now over the past couple of decades, is very much a partner to be anti-Western, to protect China against the existence of the West. It doesn't matter what the West does, whether it promotes democracy or doesn't promote democracy, it exists. Mm. It exists as a successful alternative that has resonance around the world, including in China. And so allowing Russia to fall into that orbit is something that seems unlikely the Chinese would permit. And so if their guy gets in trouble, it's possible that they might want another guy who's not in trouble and loyal to them. So, for example, Nikolai Patrushev, who is probably the most China person inside the Russian regime. I think this would be a catastrophic outcome for Russia, as well as for many other reasons. And you can judge how far away we potentially are from that outcome. Let's go to number four. Number four is you're the biggest North Korea you've ever seen. Mm. You've got an isolated place that is not part of the international system and is therefore incentivized only for mischief. And it's mischief across the board. And the Chinese are okay with this up to a point because it's not quite the puppet regime, but it's not that far from the puppet regime. The problem is like the Kim dynasty in North Korea. They get away with things, even though they're completely dependent on China, because China can't give up the North Korean regime, because then it gets a, US, a pro-US South Korea right. all the way up to the Chinese border, and we win the Korean War. And so they, they tolerate the misbehavior of their client in North Korea, and we have something similar to this dynamic in the Russian case now. We have increasing isolation from the world economy, nowhere near as close as North Korea's, but much closer to North Korea's than we were a year and a half ago. Right. And we have a person in Moscow who gives the Chinese grief. He um, ruins their relations with Europe. In other words, the Europeans don't like the Chinese support of the Russian war in Ukraine. And Xi Jinping announces that he, through his great diplomacy, has gotten Russia to promise not to use nuclear weapons. And the Chinese run this up the flagpole. And four days later, the Russians announce that they're putting tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus. Right. So there's your incipient North Korean situation, potentially. This is the path we're currently on now. It's not a good path because if you have capabilities and you're incentivized to just do mischief, if you're spoliation as far as the eye can see, and then this comes to the fifth one, which is their fear. And that's the anarchy, the collapse, right? The Tsarist Empire collapsed, came back as the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union collapsed. It didn't come back as anything, really. And so could Russia potentially collapse? It can't be excluded. It's not structured the same way as the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was a chocolate bar. If you know your chocolate bars, they have these creases right. in them already. And one crease was Ukraine, and another crease was Estonia, and another crease was Georgia. And so you could just break off the chocolate bar at the creases, and you got 15 pieces of chocolate. It was pre-structured to dissolve. Russia is not like that. It doesn't have the structure of the Soviet Union, but it's got a volatile North Caucasus where Chechnya and other uh, places have tried to get out of Russia. And so it's, it wouldn't be the same dynamic as the Soviet Union, but it's a potentially troublesome outcome. And then the sixth, you always have a sixth because that's the one which is you have no idea. It's something <laughs> that might happen that you, 
you don't foresee, you don't predict. That's why you don't make any money in the markets. That sixth one, which is also a possibility. But if you look at these, there's only really two that are solutions for the Ukraine living as a neighbor alongside Russia in peace and not just Ukraine. France and? And the authoritarian leader who's no longer a threat to the neighbors because recognizes that Russia pays a price for that too. Stephen, Ukraine specifically. Let, let, let me set this up with two brief overviews. American involvement, then the present situation on the ground. American involvement. Russia invades Ukraine on February 24th, 2022. By April, we're sending the Ukrainians howitzers. <clears throat> By June, we're sending them the HIMARS rocket launch, launcher. And we now know that the Ukrainians only fire the rocket launcher when we give them a specific target. Uh, in December, we send them the Patriot system. Early this year, we begin sending them armored vehicles, and, and then we promise them the Abrams tank. And just last week, President Biden announced that he's going to begin sending them cluster bombs. Forbes, quote, America's military role in Ukraine reflects a pattern of gradual escalation, close quote. Situation on the ground. When the Ukrainian counteroffensive began this past spring, Russia occupied about 17% of Ukrainian territory. The Russians had dug in, they'd established trenches, minefields, and so forth. So far in this offensive, the Ukrainians have been recapturing territory at the rate of less than 50 square miles per week. Graham Allison in the Washington Post, quote, if Ukrainian forces are no more successful in the weeks ahead, than they have been so far, Ukraine will not recapture all its territory for 16 years. We have escalated and escalated and escalated, and the Ukrainians are stuck. How does this end? Yeah, so it's heartbreaking what the Ukrainians have endured. This is a criminal aggression. Um, their country's being wrecked and wrecked on purpose. Their women are being raped, their children are being kidnapped, their cultural artifacts are being destroyed or looted and taken back to Moscow to disprove the existence of a separate Ukrainian nation, right? They're destroying the cultural artifacts. And so I've been supportive of Ukraine from the beginning. And they did win the victory of preventing their capital from being captured and having an occupation regime and a puppet government and being forced into insurgency. However, um, they're not winning the war. Despite that tremendous victory, and I've been saying this unfortunately for 15 months, I see Shirley, she asks me every meeting, do I still think that Ukraine is not winning the war? Shirley, don't you ask me that everyone, every one of these sessions? So, um, you not only have to win the war, you have to win the peace, which is the hard part. We lost the war in Vietnam, and arguably, we won the peace. It's one of the most pro-American countries in the world, Vietnam. And it's going to become closer and closer to us over time. Whether we deserve this or not, we can argue about the history and, and how we got there. So you can even lose the war and win the peace but you can, of course, win the war and lose the peace. And so the question then becomes, how do you define victory? What does winning the peace look like for Ukraine? And the territorial definition is something I've never held to, uh, and, and it's loosening now, finally. The idea that Ukraine wins the, the war by regaining all of its territory because this is a criminal aggression and it is their territory under international law, and the Russians should get out. I mean, it's perfectly understandable. Winning the peace means joining the West. We've spent, I don't know how many decades in the United States trashing the West. We have whole departments here at Stanford. That's their mission, you know, trashing the West. And we trash the West endlessly, and lo and behold, the Ukrainians are willing to die to join the West. They're not asking to join a rules-based order. They're not asking to join a liberal international system. This is not um, 
uh, a seminar at Brookings or an article in Foreign Affairs. They want to join the West. And so what does that mean? It means a security guarantee of some sort, and it means accession to the EU. Now, Not NATO. Uh, we'll get to that. But All right. So once again, the EU may be imperfect. Some people in the audience here may have issues with the EU. But the EU is the instrument to transform Ukraine's domestic institutions, the way it happened in Poland, and also to anchor it in this Western community of values and institutions both. So how do they do that? Well, first they need this security guarantee. And NATO cannot It cannot bring a country into the alliance while that country is at war. It's just, it's not really thinkable. Moreover, NATO is not the only option here. You can have what I call bilateral plus. I can use things like that because I've never served in government and we have secretaries of state and others here in the audience and I'm just in the Hoover ivory tower. So I can, I can talk like this. What's bilateral plus? Bilateral plus is kind of like what we have with South Korea or with Israel, or you could use other examples where we have a bilateral guarantee of their security. But the plus part is others may want to join the bilateral. So for example, Poland might want to join, or the Baltic states might want to join, or Scandinavian states might want to join. So you don't have to jump from nothing into NATO you can jump from a US-led bilateral plus, potentially. If you get a security guarantee, which has to be sold to the American public, yes, it does. because we are a democracy, and none of that work has been done. If you get a bilateral plus, then you can have an EU accession process where uh, you need a judiciary, right, an, an impartial, uncorrupt judiciary, you need a civil service, you need free and open media, you need a dynamic market economy, you need a whole lot of things that Ukraine didn't have before the Russian aggression, and they need badly. They have a wartime government now. And that transformation is hard, but the EU accession process does facilitate that transformation. Think about Reconstruction. People talk about $400 billion of reconstruction funds, which is now the minimum estimate to rebuild Ukraine. And of course, we know that Ukraine's pre-war GDP was $180 billion. So take the United States, what are we, $25 trillion? I don't, I'm probably off, but we have economists in the room who know. 29 sold. So let's put double that of reconstruction funds from the outside into the US economy, and let's see none of that money disappear. None of that money will be stolen. There'll be nothing like the COVID funds, which were a tiny fraction of US GDP, right? So they desperately need those institutions for reconstruction, to absorb those reconstruction funds, right? The Marshall Plan worked because there were functioning institutions in Europe. You, get, you have to give the money to something, to some people. And so the, this is winning the peace. Some type of security guarantee and EU accession process. It can't be like the Western Balkans. The Western Balkans began their European Union accession process when uh, Professor Condoleezza Rice and I were on a, a conference panel here together at Stanford. And I was a PhD student at Berkeley and Ronald Reagan was president almost, right? So it can't be that. It can't be uh, tick a box, okay, five years later, tick another box, right. 10 years after that, tick a box. The EU needs to reform and get its act together to be ready for Ukraine. And then of course there are issues because Ukraine uh, is not rich. And in the EU right now, there are countries that are recipients, not just donors of EU funds. Ukraine comes in, and all of those recipients of current EU funds, guess what? They become donors. 
of EU funds. So go sell that to your public at home, right? So the, we're nowhere near understanding this winning the peace problem. Now, connect that to territory, which is where you began. It would be better, and I'm in favor of Ukraine recapturing as much of its territory as it can. If it recaptures the territory, all of it, and doesn't get EU accession with a security guarantee, it doesn't win the peace. Mm. If it fails to recapture all of its territory, but it gets a security guarantee in EU accession, that's winning the peace, that's joining the West. Remember South Korea, no peace treaty, just an armistice. That's all they have on the Korean Peninsula is an armistice. And yet we have a security guarantee for South Korea and we have our troops stationed there. And so it's, it's, it's a bad outcome. The, South Korea, the Korean Peninsula is volatile. The North Korean regime is a troublemaker, as we, as we know. And the families were separated. It's, it's, it's an imperfect outcome. Still, if Ukraine got on a trajectory like South Korea, South Korea is one of the most successful societies in the world. So, and so there you are. But, but we're, we're far from that right so now. So, Stephen... That is not just plausible, that's a way. It makes sense, it's something that could be acted upon. But it feels to me as though it would be of the scale of Harry Truman in the 1950s with the Marshall Plan, the creation. In other words, an enormous amount would, re, would, re, in, would rest on whether this country was capable of an act of diplomatic and po sustained diplomatic and political creativity. Is that correct? We are. We are capable. Look around the world. We have all sorts of friends and allies and partnerships. You want to enumerate them? We don't have enough time in the show. We want to talk about Australia or the Five Eyes together. You want to talk about Japan and South Korea? You want to add Taiwan to this picture? You want to talk about Israel? You want to talk about the Emirates? You want to talk about the European Union? You want to talk about Canada? I mean, we do this. This is who we are. This is why we're prosperous and successful, because it's better to have friends than not have friends. And it's better to have friends who are rich and smart and have really good uh, tech companies and other companies and are there when you're in trouble or vice versa, right? That's the formula. It's not rocket science. I understand it clearly. So it's not rocket science. So it can be done. And the Europeans have stepped up. You know, we have this narrative that um, we've had this gradual, grudging, hesitant support for Ukraine. And it's you know, first no, and then yes, and then no, and then yes, and then no. That's a false narrative. We have supported, and as the Europeans have, including pacifist Germany, and I could go on, as our friends in East Asia have, have supported Ukraine to the hilt. And the, the scale of the support has been phenomenal. Yes. Do we know more now than we knew at the beginning? Well, yeah, it's a war, and war is a learning process, and it has surprises. So it's just, it's, it's the wrong headline. The headline is Western unity and resolve, and the West includes our friends like Australia, which is in the global south, by the way. It includes the first island chain in the Pacific, and on it goes. So the, 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 current, the current administration made a decision. It didn't want a wider war. It was going to support Ukraine, but it didn't want a wider war because it thought that that was dangerous, a bad idea, and an opportunity cost that was too high given the challenges and opportunities we face in Asia. And so from the beginning, it's wanted to support Ukraine without widening the war. Now, you can argue whether that was a good decision or a bad decision. I think it was a good decision. We don't have a wider war. 
This is not a world war. We don't have American boys and girls being killed at, at scale oh, there. We don't have the war spreading to the Levant, right, the Eastern Mediterranean, or spreading to Iran, or spreading to the South and North Caucasus, and who knows where else. And we don't have superpowers on nuclear alert. And so we've achieved an enormous amount, thanks to the Ukrainians, but also the solidarity of the West, without widening the war. And that's an achievement that has come at a cost, and the cost has been the appearance of hesitant, grudging commitment to Ukraine over certain weapon systems. People say, well, why don't you send them tanks? And we did send them tanks. But here's the problem. How long does a tank last on the battlefield? A modern tank on a battlefield today. In World War II Eastern Front, it was four and a half days. Now it's about 14 days. So you send a tank, you have to send a workshop to rebuild the tank. And behind the workshop, the workshop's got to be close to the battlefield. You can't take a broken tank and say, you know what, I'll ship it to California now and get it repaired. So you, can we send workshops to Ukraine to repair the Abrams or the other fantastic uh, um, armored vehicles we have? And then behind that, you need assembly lines because you send tanks and they last 14 days and some of them can be repaired and some of them can't be repaired. And so you need new tanks. And you need a lot of tanks if you're going to have tank warfare. And so you need to send an assembly line, as it were, not just the, the mechanical shops. And so commitments like that are not just about weapons. They're much deeper. They're about supply chain. They're about military industrial complex. And so when people clamor for things to be sent to Ukraine, they're not factoring in these other dimensions which, and in any case, war is mostly about munitions. And as we discussed nine months ago, we were going to run out of munitions. Stephen, the defense of Taiwan runs through Ukraine? So we had a debate about the pivot to Asia. Let's say that it was an unsuccessful debate. The terms were not, they were absurd. The U.S. pivoting to Asia would be like the Hoover Institution Right? Pivoting to conservatism. People would say, well, yeah, I mean, what do you mean pivot? We've kind of been there. This is our second hundred years. We were already in Asia. We had an Asian fleet from way before, uh, more predating the Hoover Institution, our Asian fleet. So the pivot to Asia debate was a little bit cockamamie. I'm going to use that technical term here because we're on air. And the idea was that we were overcommitted in all these other places and we need to undercommit there and shift all the resources to Asia. So what did we discover? We discovered that the pivot to Asia was the transatlantic alliance. Oh, so all of those friends of ours could be on our side in confronting tyranny and coercion in Asia at scale. And so if we supported Ukraine, we enhanced, strengthened our China policy across the board. And China got much weaker as a result of this. It lost Europe as an opponent of the U.S. in China policy over this Ukraine. And so you look at the um, investment we've now made, again, in our alliances. And once again, at the NATO summit, we had... Several of our Asian partners, were, in fact, they're there right now. Their dinner is probably over. They're probably a lot drunker than these poor people who don't have any wine and food in front of them. Their business is done. But if you read the communique, the headline in the media, forgive me for this, is Ukraine does not get NATO accession. Right. Read the communique. It's all about China. And it's all about standing up to China's coercion in East Asia. It's careful language. It says that China is not an enemy. We want to work with China. It's very well written. And then it enumerates all the activities that China is doing that are coercive and that are threatening the international order, liberty, prosperity. And the Europeans 
signed on to this. They signed on to paragraph after paragraph about China in this communique. So I'm looking at that thinking, yeah, okay. for sure. Stephen, let, let me give you a last question. I'm going to give you a quotation, and then I'm going to give you some recent poll results. Here's the quotation. The quotation goes back. This is 1838, Abraham Lincoln, the Young Men's Lyceum of Springfield, Illinois. At what point is the approach of danger to be expected? I answer, if it ever reach us, it must spring up amongst us. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be, our, be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die by suicide, close quote. Here's the poll. In a Wall Street Journal poll in 1998, not that long ago, 70% of Americans said patriotism was important to them. By this past spring, that figure had dropped to 38%. And among adults under 30, only 23%. Let me repeat that. The proportion of Americans under 30 who say that love of country matters to them is less than one in four. Last question, Stephen. What makes you so cheerful? You wonder why Hoover has a K through 12 education program. No wonder no longer. Uh, people don't know their own country. They don't know their institutions. They don't know their history. But that's not their fault. That's our fault. We have to do better at communicating who we are. You know, you asked the question about Russia, a thousand years of history. Can they overcome their history? Yes, France overcame its history, right? As I just described in talking about Russia. But we overcame our history too. Right? Uh, we had uh, some very big issues when we were founded as a republic. And we had a civil war. Not only did we have a civil war, we had um, a civil rights movement after Reconstruction in the South uh, didn't succeed the way some people envisioned it should. And so that story is a really big story. Overcoming our past, but with the institutions that we were granted from the outset. Right? This category citizenship is a miracle. It's exclusionary in the 18th century civic revolution. There are a lot of people who are not citizens. In fact, they're not even considered people. It's terrible. But over time, that category citizenship can expand. And people who were not included in it can be included in it. So is the exclusion the story? Which is terrible and long lasting and affects a lot of people. Or is the brilliance of the category citizenship and its capaciousness over time the story? And I would argue they're both the story, but one triumphs over the other. It's not a 100% triumph. It's not a triumph where you're done, because this is something that's ongoing. And the strength of our system is we can denounce it. That's just incredible. Imagine. You can denounce your system because you have the freedom to denounce your system. That's what your system gives you. So you can have an industry that's West bashing. I used to teach Plato to NATO back when I was, um, um, how to say this uh, per, uh, politely, I was on loan to a different institution <laughs> for 33 years. And I taught the Plato to NATO course. And it had, we capped it at 325 students, which was a significant portion of the entering freshman class. And I did it year after year. And it wasn't a requirement. And they showed up because we offered Western civilization and the professor knew how to pan, I mean, the professor knew how to lecture. <laughs> and so it can be done. We've done it before. There have been highs and lows and some of those lows we've lived through. Uh, you quoted that poll from 1998, but I remember the 70s. Mm. And certainly that was not a high point in American civilization or patriotism. But so it is in there. 
And it's on us to recuperate it and to broadcast it and to engage people with it, including engaging them in it when they disagree with it. Once again, that's the great strength of our system. And so it, you can't be anything other than optimistic with that. Okay, we have a certain media environment right now. And the media business model is destruction. It's scandal, it's destruction, it's tear down. That's how they make their money. We're a free and open society and we have to live with that problem. That's a problem we can't wish away because the solution to that problem provided by authoritarian regimes is not a solution, it's worse. And so we did this with radio, we did this with television, now we have to do it with social media. It's hard, but it can be done. And, but it can't be done by shutting things down, right? It can't be done by being afraid, afraid to engage. And it can't be done by behaving like those critics who want to shut you down, right? You can't win as an American with the strength of our institutions by doing things that are not consonant with American values and institutions. You can't behave like the people trying to destroy you because then you become like those people trying to destroy you. So it's a delicate balance to figure out. And we hear many inspiring uh, concrete proposals here at Hoover about how we can go about this. We have our Center for the Revitalization of American Institutions, right, which is uh, off the ground. And it's going to be a monster in terms of its influence. And then, and then we have 100 million plus people who are eligible to be president of the United States. 100 plus million people in our country are eligible to be president. And then we have those two leading candidates who we have. <laughs> so yeah, I'm very optimistic. St Stephen. OK. Three sentences for one of the 75% of Americans 30 or under who says he's not a patriot. Uh, it's okay to say you're not a patriot. Our patriotism allows for that. But I want to tell you something about why I'm a patriot. That's the conversation to have with them. Right? The conversation is not to belittle them not to dismiss their views and feelings, not to say you're young and you're a fool. It's to say, well, this is why I'm a patriot. This is the history that we have in this country. These are the institutions that we have. This is the opportunity that we have. And this is why you can have a successful life and you can do things that other people elsewhere who are less fortunate can barely dream of, let alone achieve. And so you engage, and if they still are holding to their views, that's okay. It's a free country, and they can be who they are. Our only problem is those who want to take the system down, right? Those people who don't just complain about hypocrisy. I'm good with hypocrisy, right? Hypocrisy is, um, let's just say, it's, it's not in deficit. Hypocrisy is everywhere, and I've engaged in it on occasion. It was always by accident, but it happened. <laughs> but what I love about hypocrisy is it calls you out for failing to live up to your ideals. To your own ideals. It says you promised this, and you failed to deliver, so you're a hypocrite. Mm. It doesn't say your ideals are evil. It, said, it says you failed. You made promises, and you didn't redeem them. So I'll take all the hypocrisy they can throw. I just don't want them to destroy the ideals as evil. And when they talk to me about, uh, well, you know, we get rid of capitalism, that'll solve a lot of problems. I say, why don't we have a little discussion about Stalin's Soviet Union and how that worked out, or Mao's China, or Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, if you prefer a smaller scale version of genocide. You can engage them in conversation based upon your specialized knowledge that can get at the 
trashing of the ideals and institutions as the evil. But as long as you're talking about hypocrisy, you're good, right? I mean, I don't want to bring Ronald Reagan into the question. Well, why not? Why, can't, why not bring Ronald Reagan in, right? So uh, he, on occasion, would tell a joke or two. You saw this firsthand. So this, uh, this guy goes up and parks the car next to Congress. And um, the policeman says, I'm sorry, sir, you can't park here. The politicians work inside. And the guy says, oh, it's OK. I locked the door. <laughs> right? That's us. That's who we are. So, yeah, we have crime, it turns out. Who knew? Stephen We're Kotkin. hypocrites. Stephen Kotkin, thank you. <laughs> for, for Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution, I'm Peter Robinson. <laughs>